I have to say. Thank you so much for coming this Saturday morning. And I'm, I'm really excited by the opportunity to tell you some of these things about how elements are made um, in astrophysics. So before we get started, we're going to be talking about things that are on very small scales, well outside the human experience, very small and very large. So before we get going, so that you have some visual in your head, some form of an intuition about the, the objects that we're talking about, I'm going to go ahead and play this video, okay, which is going to demonstrate scales. So right now, it has human scales and things that we usually see on our scale. But it's going to start to zoom in as soon as I can get it to play. It's going to go smaller and smaller. OK, now we're starting to see rice. We're starting to see pixels, starting to see cells. We're going to keep going all the way down past DNA, past atoms. Keep going. OK, now we're getting to nuclei and the electron, protons, neutrons. We'll talk about those a bit today. Keep going. High energy neutrinos, quarks. Keep going. And we arrive at the neutrino. So we're going to be talking about the neutrino a little bit today and how it impacts some of the astrophysical phenomenon. So let's zoom back out. Let's get back to those human scales that we're used to dealing with. And then once we get there, we're going to zoom out. Okay, so here we go. Now we're going out. All right. We're seeing Mount Everest, big states like Texas, some planets. There goes the Earth. Keep going. There went our sun. All right, we're going to keep going bigger and bigger. Okay. Keep going. Start to see some nebula. Keep going. We're going to start to see some galaxies, some smaller galaxies. Keep going. And there we are. Now we're at our Milky Way galaxy, OK? So with all of the things I talk about today, keep in mind that we have stuff on very, very small scales that are going to be affecting things on very, very large scales. It's all working together. OK. So let's begin with this quote that you may or may not have heard from astrophysicist Carl Sagan. We are made of star stuff. Our bodies are made of star stuff. There are pieces of star within us all. So what, is, what Carl is saying is if you look at the composition of the human body, it can be roughly broken down like this. But additionally, there's, there's something that you have intuition for, that you, you breathe everyday oxygen. You know what oxygen is. You know you need it to live. You exhale carbon dioxide, OK? Carbon and oxygen. Additionally, even heavier things like iron are within your blood and used to transport oxygen throughout your system. That's what it helps with. So even heavier elements beyond things like carbon and oxygen are integral to um, our, our human bodies. But additionally, so Carl was talking about these elements mostly, but heavy elements too, such as gold, are also formed in astrophysical events. So we're going to talk about that today. That's going to be one of the focuses after we get you through a basic understanding of how it's astrophysics as the site of where elements are ultimately formed to begin with. Okay, So this is a very beautiful and well-known quote, but... It should be noted that this is something that Carl said, yes, and he phrased it beautifully, but this idea was a revolution that came about within the 50s, okay? So this was coming before Carl's time, and when it comes to heavy elements and realizing that there are many types of processes that could be producing elements within uh, the universe, it was primarily these guys, Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle in the 50s that put forth this idea. So what Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle said was that if you look at our sun, the element composition of our sun shows signatures of multiple distinct astrophysical processes that have contributed to our Milky Way. Okay, 
So if you take a look on the right, I have the periodic table that most people are familiar with elements from looking at a periodic table, color-coded by where we think they are dominantly being produced within the universe, okay? So you're, you're gonna see a lot of star stuff, right? Exploding massive stars, dying low mass stars, exploding white dwarfs, the Big Bang, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then you also see this orange box that I have highlighted and just named R process. R process is the rapid neutron capture process. It's a process that can happen where you have nuclei that can capture neutrons very, very quickly to produce the heavier elements, okay? And we know that we need this in order to produce the heaviest elements such as gold, but we don't really know at this point in time where the R process is happening and, and uh, ultimately what's contributing to what we see in the sun. Okay. One thing that I wanted to point out about this is this is back in the 50s that they're coming up with these ideas. Burbage and Burbage was a married team, and the first Burbage is Margaret Burbage, a woman, a powerhouse of a woman, leading this um, back in the 50s, okay? And their, their work has set the foundation for what we now call nuclear astrophysics. All right, but let's back out just a little bit and familiarize ourselves with the building blocks of this picture. So if we take a look at the periodic table, let's take a look at carbon, for example. It's labeled with a six because of its proton content. Six protons, six neutrons, okay? And then electrons orbiting this nucleus. Heavier nuclei that arrive later in the periodic table with higher numbers have more protons, more neutrons, more electrons within their system, okay? So you can see that some of these lighter nuclei we can get to by things like stars and, and ordinary stellar processes, but some of the heavier ones, it's, we're going to need to investigate exactly where those are coming from. Now, this is the periodic table that you may be familiar with. But I'm going to show you what is considered to be the periodic table equivalent for nuclear physics. It's called the nuclear chart. So the periodic table was labeled based upon proton number, but you can have a nucleus that has different numbers of neutrons in it. So we call those isotopes. So when you look at this nuclear chart, it's organized by proton number and neutron number. So you can now see all of those possible isotopes that we have observed within experiments on Earth or, or um, elsewhere and things like this. So here we have, uh, in the black are going to be things we call stable nuclei. But outside of that are unstable nuclei that we know exist, but they don't survive. They are, they're going to decay away within some time period. And you can see the color coding is telling you the type of decay that that nucleus will dominantly undergo. We'll talk a bit about those types of processes later, but this is the idea. I wanted you guys to get familiar with looking at exactly this plot, this nuclear chart, because I'm going to make use of it quite a lot in presenting uh, different ideas for how these types of elements are being formed. Okay, so let's get started with just, let's build up our intuition. We saw on that periodic table that some of the lightest elements are produced in the Big Bang. So let's build up from the lightest. So Big Bang nucleosynthesis is something that happens on the order of minutes after the universe is first um, created. So you can see here what we call the Big Bang nucleosynthesis reaction network, where you have neutrons that can decay into protons. Those can collect a neutron and become what we call deuterium. That can collect another neutron and become what we call tritium, okay? These are just heavy hydrogen. These are heavy isotopes of hydrogen. You can go on to have capture reactions or decays that then produce different helium isotopes as well, which can go on to produce things maybe a bit heavier, such as lithium and beryllium, but really not much of it, okay? So the Big Bang nucleosynthesis primarily makes hydrogen and helium. But when I say that, I mean these other isotopes of it as well, okay? So that's what we have in the beginning. Now, to get heavier, we're gonna look at stars. 
So stellar fusion is a process by which you have this cloud of gas now. I just said we've got a bunch of hydrogen and helium out there already from the Big Bang. So that's how our sun has started, just a big cloud of gas that undergoes, it starts to collect and undergo gravitational collapse. And at some point, it becomes hot and dense enough that nuclear reactions, fusion, turns on and pushes back. It emits an energy that emit, then, then corresponds to an outward pressure that keeps the star from collapsing, okay? Now, um, you have to have it hot and dense enough to overcome proton repulsion. Basically, we know that things of like charge are gonna repel each other. So this is why you can't just have this process occur. You have to get to certain conditions before it can turn on, okay? All right, so this is how this is all going. We've got this, this inward pull, and then fusion is going to push out, and you're gonna do things like take some tritium and some deuterium and turn it into helium, all right? And release a bunch of energy at the same time. So this unit, uh, this is something like on the order of 10 what we call mega electron volts, but let's not get into the details of the unit. The point is that this is, this is something like 100 plus times the energy of the temperature of the star already. So within this environment, it's a decent amount of energy that you're depositing into the environment, a really decent amount of energy. Okay, so as I mentioned, the sun is mostly hydrogen and helium, and we have observations that support this, we know this, okay? So this is a breakdown from 2009 of the, the content of the sun. So you can see something like 74% hydrogen and 25% helium. So the primary uh, reactions going on in the sun that power the sun are up here. They're called the PP chain, where you have hydrogen fusing into heavy hydrogen, fusing into a helium isotope, and then moving forward in this, in this chain that we call the PP chain, okay? So you may say, all right, well, this sounds interesting, but how do you know? <laughs> how do you know that this is actually what's happening in the sun? Well, we have observables. So notice that up in the top, when you're fusing hydrogen, there's this little, uh, we call it nu, it's a Greek letter, that's a particle that's coming out, that's your neutrino that I showed you before. So this is one of our pieces of evidence that we have a good picture of what's happening in the sun. So first of all, the pretty, pretty picture is a picture of the sun taken in neutrinos, okay? These are the neutrinos coming from the sun. Now the bottom plot is going to be the flux, how many neutrinos we're seeing, roughly, coming from the sun as a function of energy. And you can see explicitly that that PP chain right there that I've just showed you is what's producing the dominant amount of energy, okay? So we have observables to look at in order to validate our models. Now, this is the sun, but there's a lot of stars out there. So stellar nucleosynthesis doesn't just fuse hydrogen to helium, all right? It can go beyond that. But the process that I described of having something start to gravitationally collapse and then having a, a nuclear fusion reaction push out against the collapse keeps going. So as you can see, we have that hydrogen going to helium as our first step. But then at some point, you get to a point where you exhaust that fuel, that hydrogen fuel mostly, at the boundary down there, and then you're going to start collapsing, okay? But then you're gonna again get to these new temperatures and densities that can support new types of fusion into things like carbon. Then you can keep going, 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 going. They call this the onion sometimes. So how far you can go within this type of mechanism, like how far in terms of how heavy of an element you can produce, ultimately depends on the initial conditions of the star, things like its initial mass. So over here on the left, you can see the time scales associated with something like a 15 mass star, 15 solar mass star, 15 times the mass of our sun, 
to go through all of these different phases. So at first, this hydrogen to helium phase is something like 10 million years. Then you keep going, and then when we're getting to carbon, something like 1,000. Keep going down, something like oxygen, it's just going to take a year. And then you keep going down. Now, do you see when you get to this point, there's something called an iron core. So why iron? Why an iron core? Well, when you're fusing things together in this manner, it releases energy, as we saw. So this means that you have the products of, these, of this fusion be much more bound and, and stable. They like these conditions. They like to be turned into iron, okay? It'll release energy. It's, it's, it's something that can happen. But once you get to iron, the property, which is called the nuclear binding energy, starts to turn over. So basically, it's not going to release energy anymore to produce these products, okay? It's going to take energy to try to produce anything above that, all right? So it's at the iron isotopes that we sort of stall with this beautiful fusion pushing back process. We can't really go any further than this, all right? Now, you hit that iron core, and notice at the bottom here, that all of these processes are doing things like going to heavier and heavier and heavier. But when you get to iron, look what it says the products are, neutrons. Hmm, this is curious. So what's happening is that at some point, if you have a heavy enough star, you get down to that iron and you just, you stall out. You can't go any further. But you still have so much pressure going on, so much inward gravitational push, that you start to capture things onto the iron, as you can see here, and produce a bunch of helium. Then that helium is going to capture other particles that are around as well, produce a bunch of protons and neutrons. Then the electrons around start to capture as well and produce primarily neutrons. Okay, so this is how, in the end, you're going to get something that's primarily composed of neutrons at the core if you have a heavy enough star, all right? So once you get to that neutron boundary, there's something that prevents those neutrons from going any further, and it pushes back. And that's when you have a shock wave go out, and that's when the star explodes. So if you've heard of a supernova explosion, this is how it's happening, or at least this is one type of supernova explosion. It's called the core collapse supernova, okay? Now, these are super cool. Uh, they can get, you see that with, under this process, you can go through up to iron, but then what happens when it explodes? What elements can be made when it explodes? Well, if you had asked somebody maybe 20 years ago, they would tell you, oh yeah, those really heavy things from before, things like gold, things like uranium, that, that our process can make, that could be coming from core collapse supernova. So this was a favored site for heavy element production, things like gold and uranium, um, something like prior to 15 years ago. So the way that this is happening is, as you can see, when this shot goes out, you have a bunch of neutrinos that come with it from before. It's such a dense environment that these neutrinos that can go through the whole of the Earth without interacting can get trapped. That's how dense this environment is. They get trapped and they interact. And through these types of processes where they can interact with nuclei and convert protons into neutrons and neutrons into protons and emit some neutrons, you can get neutrons in this environment that can capture and then form even heavier elements. So this was a potential favored site for heavy element production something like 20, 15 years ago. However, people do hydrodynamic simulations of these things. And now they're not seeing that they can produce these types of conditions that can support production of the heaviest elements. So the conditions needed to synthesize elements past roughly silver um, are no longer supported by these core collapse supernova simulations. So something like a uranium has proton number of 92, silver proton number 47, we've got a long way to go, right, if we're getting stuck at silver within core collapse supernova. 
Now down here is an actual plot of what they're getting out of their supernova simulations of the abundance, we call it, how many nuclei you have relative to other species as a function of proton number. So you can see explicitly for yourself that all of their models that exploded did not really get past roughly a, a Z of 50. It's, even, it's a push to even say 50, okay? So we'll talk more about getting to those heavy elements later, but you know, again, like we did with the sun, I told you the story about how the sun is working, but then I said, how do we know? You always have to ask, how do we know? What's the evidence? Well, what's the evidence that they're a core collapse supernova? We've seen some, <laughs> is, is one thing. So first of all, this is a very famous core collapse supernova from, from a while back now, supernova 1987A, where we saw from this event both the neutrinos and the light, all right? When you have an event, an astrophysical event that happens, and you're able to receive observables, distinct observables, we call this a multi-messenger event because you can test your models in more than one way. You have more than one data point, more than one observation to test your models, okay? So we have observed core collapse supernova happen in real time, but we've also seen their remnants, okay? So these aren't all core collapse supernova remnants. Some of them are different types of supernova that I didn't talk about. Um, but nevertheless, we look out there in the universe and we see these things that remain from after these types of explosions. All right. So I just used the word remnant. I mean, it's, it's somewhat of an intuitive word, but we're going to make more use of it, so let's talk about it more. So this is a picture of ultimately what can happen and what, where, the ultimate fate of a star as a function of its mass, more or less, okay? So this is a rough picture of how things go. So you can see that you have all of these different possibilities. Let's first focus on this particular one where the protostar is between 0.4 to 8 solar masses. That's because that's our star that I want to focus on it. What's going to happen to our sun, basically? So you may have heard this spiel that at some point, our sun is going to become a red giant and, and consume the Earth, okay? But after this, it's going to move on to become something called a white dwarf, all right? So what is a white dwarf? A white dwarf is during the conditions where it's going down and it's fusing heavier and heavier, like we saw with that onion, you get to some point like carbon oxygen, oxygen neon, oxygen neon, magnesium, et cetera, where it just can't go any further, okay? These things are incredibly dense, something like 200,000 times as dense as, dense as the Earth with roughly the same size. Very dense objects out there. All right, so that's the ultimate fate of our sun. But if you look up, I want to talk about this supernova issue now. We just talked about supernova, and their ultimate remnant is something called a neutron star. So what is a neutron star, okay? So it's something like 12 miles in diameter, about the size of Manhattan. And as a matter of fact, here we have a comparison of the size of a neutron star relative to Vancouver. So did you guys see the neutron star that was hanging out over Vancouver? <laughs> No, because it wasn't there, we would not be here if something like this happened. Now, why am I saying that? Because they're incredibly dense objects. It is 1.4 to 2.35 times more massive than our sun, packed into that small diameter. So, one teaspoon of this it contains the mass of something like 700 great pyramids. So yeah, if there was a neutron star hanging out, you wouldn't be here right now. But just incredibly, incredibly dense objects hanging out out there. And we're detecting these things, seeing these things now more and more. This 2.35 upper bound is fairly new, actually. It's over the last few years that we have seen this particular neutron star, and we're seeing more and more, and testing the boundaries of how heavy these can be. Okay, so now we have a feeling for the processes that different stars can go through, the elements that they can make. 
But let's back up and think again about our sun and how our sun came to be what it is and contain the elements that it has, okay? Remember that Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle from the beginning said that our sun shows signatures that it was enriched by many different types of events. So what does this mean? So you can have something like our sun become a red giant and undergo its processes. Maybe it's even more massive and it becomes a supernova. But nevertheless, over the course of these processes, it can eject elements into the interstellar medium, which goes on to enrich the gases in the interstellar medium in which new stars form. Then these stars are formed already with some of this element composition in them, then they go on to form solar systems, et cetera, and the process continues. This is a process called galactic chemical evolution, okay? So our job in nuclear astrophysics is not only to answer the question of where are the elements formed, but when were the elements formed, okay? When were different elements formed? Now, this is the old school picture of things, back when people thought, yeah, it's core collapse supernova that are producing the heaviest. But things have gotten more complicated now. There's many different types of things that can then go on to happen. So as we talked about, there's now remnants. Things like neutron star mergers can go on to find each other and merge. Things like white dwarfs can merge themselves or accrete from stars, okay? You also have something called magnetorotationally driven supernova, very rare, very high magnetic field types of supernova that could, in principle, make heavier elements, and things like collapsars, where the progenitors, the progenitor stars are very, very heavy, okay? Now, all of these that I've circled in red are what we call our process candidate sites. Again, we're not really sure exactly all the places that the R process is happening within the universe. Um, and so we study all of these different possibilities, how they could play into this picture, and if there's signatures in stars and other observations that these are at play. So down here, I have highlighted exactly where our process is happening. It's happening in that nuclear chart in very, very neutron-rich, unstable regions, okay? But let's first talk about one of these sites in particular. I'm gonna focus on this binary neutron star merger. Why? Because we saw one. <laughs> so about five years ago or so now, there was an event where we now have the ability to detect gravitational waves with something called LIGO. This is a whole other talk in itself, and I'm not going to be able to explain this. But you saw how incredibly dense these neutron stars are. So the fact that these, these very dense, very heavy objects are sitting out there in space, they actually warp the space time around them. Then when they go on to merge, they produce something called gravitational waves that you can see here that ripple through space-time and come to us, and we can observe them at this point in time. This upper right plot here is from something called LIGO, a gravitational wave detector, and this is exactly the signal that it saw letting us know these guys are in spiraling and then they're merging. Okay. So what happened is that LIGO told the telescope community we saw something. We saw two neutron stars that merged. Go point your telescopes at it and see what kind of light is coming off, what kind of um, observables you can see. So something like one-third of the astronomical community, over 70 observing teams, turned their telescopes to follow this merger event. And let's see an, a, a uh, video, an artist's rendi rendition of what happened. Okay. Oh no, I really don't like the sound. <laughs> it's, it's very grandiose and like way too much. Okay. Okay. All right. Here we go. They're they're merging. They're in spiraling. They're gonna find each other. Eventually, speed up. Warp each other in space. And boom. Okay. We have an outward. Um, we have outward emission of things, we have a jet, now we have this after blue glow, you should have noticed that that was a bit blue, and then it turned to red a little bit here. So let's watch it again. 
just since it happens quickly enough that you can see it. So you can tell already from their beautiful color coding and things, which is, this is just for instructive purposes, but you can tell from their color coding, we've got many different types of emission of, of, of light and particles and things coming off of this. All right. So this was observed across the electromagnetic spectrum and the ultraviolet in the IR and in the radio. This was a very, very well studied event. Okay. So what can we say then from seeing the light from this event? Well, we can get an idea of what elements were produced. So this is the next piece that I'm going to, to try to, to walk you through here. All right. So from this particular event, the light that comes out of it we call a kilonova. All right. So the light curves from these events are going to depend on what's present, what nuclei it produced, what species are present. All right. So from this event, we know that they can produce at least lanthanide elements. So I'm going to try to convince you of this. Now, first of all, what's a lanthanide element? Let's go back to our periodic table. And you can see explicitly these orange guys here are lanthanides. Now, I've also put down some gold bars right there on the periodic table. So you can see explicitly for yourself that lanthanides are lighter, then there's gold, then beyond gold is something called the actinides, things like uranium, plutonium, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So when I say at least lanthanides, I don't necessarily mean anything else. You see exactly what I mean now. Now we're going to go down here and we're going to look at an astrophysics model. All right? This is a model that what they do is to look at the light that would come out, the strength of the light, as a function of days and the shape of the light as a function of days. And you can see that as you get more and more lanthanides, x lan, just, they're just increasing the amount of lanthanides, you are taking what was something very sharply peaked in the beginning and broadening it out and having some kind of hump more around five days. Additionally, you're going to shift the light to different wavelengths, okay? So you actually shift the light towards infrared emission if you have lanthanides present. So this is the model. What did they see? This is the observation, all right? So you can see explicitly these are the different photometric bands in which they observe, the infrared, the red, and the blue. You can see explicitly that at an earlier time we had some blue emission followed by a later time of this type of infrared emission and red emission with this peak, this nice little bump right at around five days. So you can see those features that we're looking for within the light curve to suggest that we produce these elements for yourself. Okay. All right, so we have some evidence to believe that at least lanthanides were produced. But you may have heard about this or seen some news story on it. Physicists know where all the gold was made. Physicists know where all the platinum was made. You see exactly where gold is. So I temper that enthusiasm. It's great that there's this enthusiasm, but that is an oversimplification and an overstatement. You can see gold is beyond the lanthanides. It's unclear whether or not these things reach further than the lanthanides. So they might not be the full story of, of um, element production, heavy element production. OK, so now we've seen that the elements that are present affect our observables. So let's get more into the nuclear physics a little bit. So to actually study these things from the nuclear physics up towards what you would expect, for the observables, you have to take into account things called reaction rates, things like neutron capture, where you capture a neutron and emit a photon, proton capture, alpha capture. Note that the alpha particle is just helium, okay? This is just a uh, historical thing, basically. But nevertheless, you have to take into account how when you have some elements and they interact with other elements, what they might produce. These are also energy dependent, so especially when you're in an astrophysical plasma, you're going to have to average over things like temperature. Decays, we talked about this just a little bit, but basically these things that are unstable are going to decay into other things that are more stable, all right? So there's many different types of decay. There's beta decay, where you have a neutron ultimately turning into a proton and releasing an anti-neutrino. 
There's alpha decay, where it just spits out an alpha particle. There's fission. Fission is another type of decay because you have something that's unstable and it's going to find a different stable state that is not its, its current configuration. Okay. So now we know something about the environment, these neutron star mergers. We know something about the nuclear physics that's going on. Let's put it all together. All right. So what we're going to watch here is a movie of producing the elements within a neutron star merger simulation. I've taken what my colleagues have given me from a hydrodynamic simulation of the time, temperature, density, how that all evolves um, within their simulations, and I've put it through what we call my nuclear reaction network that takes into account all of those reactions and decays in real time and tells me what's going to be produced. So in the bottom, you're going to see in the NZ plane, or this nuclear chart way of looking at things, all of the elements that are produced in real time, they're going to be color-coded by the dominant reaction channel that they are undergoing at the time. Okay, so that's what you'll see down here. Up top, you're going to see a red line emerge that sums up the different elements as a function of mass number, proton number plus neutron number and compares it to the sun. So what we have here is the content of the sun that we believe to have come from the R process. We take the total of what we see in the sun and we subtract out things that we believe should have come from other sources. And this is what we end up with, the so-called solar R process residual. So we always compare our calculations to this because we ultimately, one of the ultimate questions is, is this the kind of environment that is producing what we see, or that did produce what we see in the sun? Okay, so let's go ahead and play it. All right, we're gonna start out in an equilibrium of sorts and then we break out of equilibrium. You can see the time and the temperature evolving. We start to make things that are heavier and heavier. We get all the way up into the actinides in these neutron star merger conditions. We're going to fission and deposit things right back down near that lanthanide region that were not there before. And you can see everything just decay back towards stability because these are not stable nuclei. They will not survive. The whole main part of the pattern up through gold-ish is set on the order of seconds. And it's these longer time scale decays of actinides through alpha decay and spontaneous fission that ultimately shape the actinides um, and, and their abundances uh, ultimately later in time. Okay? So that's the R process. This is what we're expecting from first principles. Um, from doing these calculations up through what a hydrodynamic simulation says a merger should do through the nuclear physics, okay? So now that you've seen this for yourself and you've seen this solar signature of these R process elements, let's go back to this ultimate revelation, ultimate statement of Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle that we call B squared FH sometimes, okay? So this down here is the solar abundance curve. It's everything, all right? It's the relative numbers of different elements as a function of atomic mass, proton plus neutron, all the way through, okay? And this is an interesting plot to look at because the red dots are a more updated evaluation from 2003, and this blue line is what they were already working with in the 50s. Not too bad, <laughs> okay? All right, but the point is what these pioneers said that's very, very insightful is it's generally been stated that the atomic abundance curve has an exponential decline after approximately mass number 100 and then is approximately constant thereafter. Although this is very roughly true, it ignores many details which are important clues to our understanding of element synthesis. So this is exactly correct. You can see that we've got this peak and then it kind of flattens out, but these little bumps are very significant, okay? So one thing that I wanna ask you while, you're, while we're here, this peak right here, does anybody have an idea why there might be a lot of this in the sun and what it is. It's iron, exactly. 
Okay, so now you're already starting to see some of these nuclear physics properties come out. Iron is especially stable. Things like supernova produce a lot of it, and there it is in our sun. So our sun has been enriched by a bunch of supernova events. Okay, all right, but that's, the, that's in my world the lighter stuff. Let's get to the heavier stuff. Okay, so I'm going to try to demonstrate that their quote here and what it means. Let's go to the nuclear chart to understand this a little better. All right, so in the nuclear chart, you can see these lines that are marking what we call magic numbers or shell closures. It's regions, it's configurations of the nucleus that are especially stable. So you can see that as the R process goes through, for example, it kind of hangs out in these stable regions doesn't really want to capture anything, doesn't really want to decay. It just wants to stay there. It likes, it likes this nice little stable state, okay? So now let's just plop on top of it what we see in the sun. Just rotate it and take a quick look. You can see for yourself, if we did not know about those shell closures from nuclear physics experiments, the sun could tell us that something is there because you see these bumps, these enhancements in the abundances at exactly where we have these shell closures. Now, if you take a look in the middle here between what we call the second R process peak and the third R process peak, looks kind of like there's another little bump, isn't there? Well, this is called the R process rare earth peak and we do not know what is causing this, okay? You can see when you map it out to where the nuclear physics that might be producing this type of signature, it's outside of what we've measured. That region right there is what we've measured, and the green is this unexplored territory. So we don't know what properties there are there. So this is something that my, my research and my research program has focused on, is trying to explain the origin of this rare earth peak. So the way that we do this is through something called Markov Chain Monte Carlo. It's a statistical method. So if you've heard of things like machine learning, this is related to that, kind of like that, but not really. The idea is essentially you're gonna take a guess, then you're gonna adjust it, and you're just gonna do this tens of thousands of times, accept, reject, accept, reject, until you get something that matches your observation. So what we're gonna do, you saw explicitly for yourself that the properties of those nuclei were making peaks or not making peaks. So let's go ahead and adjust the nuclear masses, that's what we're gonna do down here, relative to a baseline model. This red line baseline model, you can see its abundances up top, on average, flat. Doesn't really produce that peak. Now we're gonna start adjusting the masses. If my movie will play. It's not wiggly. Oh no. Okay, hold on. We're gonna, we're gonna try to, oh no, I may have, maybe that's a bad idea, but I'm risking it. Ah. Oh. Okay, it's not wiggling. All right, well luckily I've plotted the final <laughs> in the initial. But this, if this was working, you would have seen this red line wiggle, 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 wiggle around until it gets to the blue line. That would represent tens of thousands of steps, tens of thousands of guesses that we've taken. And ultimately we get to this prediction for the nuclear masses needed to form that bump. Now, this is just one Monte Carlo run we want to make sure that we have an uncertainty involved. So we do this 50 times, something like 50 times. And this is the band that we get up top that represents our error from the 50 runs. Now, you can see these black points. We had experimental colleagues at Argonne National Lab come to us and say, what do you need? What, it, what masses do you need in order to be able to understand this peak? We want to do some measurements connected to this. We told them about our results, or we told them about what we were doing, did not show them our results. They went out and measured these, and we had an independent consistency between what we predicted and what they went out and measured, okay? Now you can see at the bottom exactly that this red solution, or these masses, are producing a peak 
where there was no peak before. But is this the full story? Well, not quite, because this right here, that drop from 102 to 104, is what we need to see in order to form the peak. So their measurements are getting close, but they're not quite there. And there are actually some accepted proposals to go after that now. All right. So this is all well and good, but what we really want to do is compare their masses and our predictions in a way such that we can shed light on the type of environment in which these heavy elements might be forming. So we do this calculation for different types of astrophysical conditions. And you can see a different type of astrophysical condition in the blue needs different masses in order to form the peak. And it's not really lining up with what they see in experiment. So it's through this sort of um, merger, if you will, of experiment and theory that we're hoping to shed light on the origin of um, the R process elements in the sun. OK, I think I'm going to skip over this, which is truly unfortunate. But it is what it is. Yeah. OK, so I convinced you earlier, I, hopefully I, I convinced you a bit, that, that we made at least lanthanide elements in this neutron star merger event. But did we go beyond lanthanides? Did we go to gold? Did we make actinides? We don't know. So it's interesting that, again, this Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle back in the 50s took a look at supernova, supernova light curves, and said, you know what, we think that there's Californium 254 in there. At the time, they had seen, that had just been observed, that Californium 254 had an anomalously long half-life. Fission, things can happen really, 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 really quickly, but this takes 60 days for this division. It's anomalously long, OK? So th their idea was when this thing fissions, you release a lot of energy when you fission, a lot of energy. And it can put heat into the environment and affect the light that comes out. But you now know that all of these things that we see, this zoo that we see of possible astrophysical processes, such as supernova, aren't really getting up to those regions of actinides. You saw before that quark collapse supernova could only get to something like silver. So it's not making things like uranium, plutonium, et cetera. It's the R process that can. So this was in the literature back in the 50s, and that's where it was left. It's in some textbooks, even, about quark collapse supernova. But that's where it was left until we came along and said, hey, I mean, Neutron star mergers can make actinides, potentially. So if it makes californium, could we see it? OK? So this is what we did. We did a calculation in which we did have californium populated. And we compared it to when we don't have californium populated. OK? This is the light that you would see as a function of time for different photometric uh, wavelengths, for different observational wavelength bands, basically. So you can see that, for example, if you're looking at the sensitivity of the James Webb Space Telescope, if we produce Californium, it could be the difference between detection and non-detection with JWST. So previously, there was really no way to say OK, we've gone beyond lanthanides. But we highlighted a way in which potentially, if you see the signature of this guy, you can say, all right, they got all the way up to the actinides. They are capable of making the heaviest elements. So still a bunch of open questions. OK, so the last point that I just want to make is an international and multidisciplinary community is working to answer these questions. We all need each other. I already highlighted observations. I already hi highlighted nuclear physics experiments. I highlighted some of the nuclear astrophysics theory work that I do. I highlighted the hydrodynamic simulation people working on the conditions to tell me um, what's going on in these so that I can make predictions, et cetera. So it takes, the whole, it takes a whole bunch of communities. It's multidisciplinary science. And I just wanted to highlight that some measurements of relevance to this process are happening just down the street at Triumph. So this is what's happening in your, your own backyard, basically. We're trying to study these elements and figure out what we see from different events. OK, so I'm just going to wrap up by reminding you about the whole journey that we just took today 
from looking at the very smallest things to how they are influencing how a star lives, how a star dies, what happens with its remnants, and how all of these impact the structure of our galaxy, the content of our galaxy, which then in turn impact the content of our solar system, which then in turn impacts the content of the Earth and all of the elements available for biology, and therefore influences us. Okay, so just thanks for listening, and uh, yeah. <laughs>